the experimental Sunday where we inch our way back to in-person worship. Thank you for being guinea pigs. I, I'm sorry, I mean volunteers um, to help us this week. Welcome to those who remain joining us from home. As you know, next week we return to in-person worship. Um, and although we may not actually need three services, we want to start with three services um, because it's much easier to drop one than to add one. Much easier to realize we don't need three uh, than to start worshiping together and think, well, oh, yikes, we really needed an extra one. So at least for the time being, we're going to have worship services at 9, 10, and 11. That means the preacher is going to have to be pretty concise. Not this week. This is my last week to be long-winded. You're welcome. But when we return to worship in person, of course, everything will be a little briefer uh, because we aim to have worship last about 40 minutes to give us 20 minutes changeover between services. So, reservations are required, not just requested, but required. You can go online through our website, or you can call the church office, and someone in the office will fire up the online reservation and make it for you. At Young Families, we have space reserved specifically for you, so don't book online, just call the church office and we'll take the reservations that way. Young families are welcome back to worship in person with us. This is the first week that we have moved all of the cameras and the lights. The cameras and the lights that were on tripods, the soundboard that was over there, all of the paraphernalia of worship that we'd built up over the last few months, just leaving things on pews in case we needed them again. This week was our grand clean-out, and now you can sit in the pews. It also means that this is the first week with cameras mounted around the church, the first week where everything, both online and in person, is being run through the sound system. And so, if we have a glitch or two here and there, forgive us. Uh, we've become accustomed to a certain way of doing it, and now we're changing again. Does that sound familiar? In fact, I think that might even preach. So, welcome back to worship. Uh, I say again, though, to people who um, are ill or whose immune system is compromised, just because we're returning to in-person worship doesn't mean that you must be here. You have my permission, and I'll give it to you in writing if you need it, to simply stay home until you're well or until you're stronger or until it's safe for you to come. Please do not feel obligated to return to in-person worship. We'll continue like this forever and ever, amen, with worship being broadcast by Facebook and the website. So just come back when you're ready and when it's safe to do so. But my sincere thanks to everyone who's been part of this. Um, whether they wanted to be or not, whether we dragooned you into it, or, or whether you wanted to come but couldn't because of circumstances, thank you for your patience, thank you for your support and your love and your care. Your emails have been wonderful. The phone calls have made our week. Thank you um, for all that you've done in this time of strangeness as we start to return to what passes for normal. A reminder that uh, you have worship bulletins in your hands, but I know that some of you printed your own at home, which is wonderful. Um, and people at home today who will be joining us next week, there would be bulletins enough for everyone here every week. But if you want to print your own at home, well, you know where the paper has been, um, or if you want to download it to your tablet or cell phone and use that in worship next week, feel free. Lastly, uh, yesterday was the 50th wedding anniversary of Terry and Jerry Copper. And so, uh, sincere uh, words of congratulations and love to Terry and to Jerry. Uh, Terry, get well soon. And to both of you, heartfelt congratulations on your golden wedding anniversary from your family at St. Armand's Key Lutheran Church. And now, let's compose our hearts and our minds for worship.
please stand. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance. We deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought word and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us. And in your spirit, lead us, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace, our sins are forgiven. Let us live now in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. God of heaven and earth, before the foundation of the universe and the beginning of time, you are the triune God. 
author of creation, eternal word of salvation, life-giving spirit of wisdom, guide to all truth by your spirit, that we may proclaim all that Christ has revealed and rejoice in the glory he shares with us. Glory and praise to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Good morning. Our first reading is taken from the first chapter of Genesis. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so. God called the dome sky. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night. And let them, let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures and let birds fly ab above the earth and across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind, the cattle of every kind, and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, 
and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And so every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. The word of the Lord. from the 13th chapter of 2 Corinthians. Paul writes, Finally, brothers and sisters, farewell. Put things in order. Listen to any appeal. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. The word of the Lord. Holy 
Holy Gospel according to John. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw Him, they worshipped Him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. So, I'm enjoying preaching without a timer. I may be the only one who's enjoying me preaching without a timer. But when you were last here, there was a time when I was quoting a lot of Greek and Hebrew. And I'm going to do it again today, but I promise you it's just one single Greek word. Okay, just, just one. For the whole 30-minute sermon, just one Greek word. You should see the look of fear. I couldn't see your mouths, but your eyes went, distazo. It's a Greek word that gets translated into English as doubt. You know, many worshipped him, but some doubted. You heard it in John's Gospel. And doubt is a reasonably good English translation, but like all translations, it can be a bit of a pig in a poke. I mean, you know, you, you rely on the person translating it, what the tradition says, all the multiplicity of possibilities. But distazo has another meaning in, in, in Greek. Uh, two meanings that I quite like. Uh, one that's a little more commonplace, to be in two minds. You know? When, when we decided to return to in-person worship, the vote was unanimous in the leadership, but pretty much all of us were kind of in two minds. It's a very human thing to experience. The other meaning is a state of uncertainty. Now, isn't that a great definition? A state of uncertainty. That means, in my not-so-humble opinion, that the word distazo should be the word for the COVID-19 pandemic. And in the United States, the word for the tumult that we're experiencing now. Because isn't that a great description? A state of uncertainty. With COVID-19, we see the light at the end of the tunnel. We're starting to come back to normality. Although we're also discovering that infection rates are going up. But we're starting to return to normality, but we don't know when things will be back to normal. And we actually don't know for sure what normal is going to look like down the line. As someone who's told you before that I believe that normal is only a setting on the dishwasher, I don't know what the future is going to look like. We're in a state of uncertainty. Some of our cities are burning. And even where they're not burning, and even when they're not burning, we look around at our country and, and hear the words of Abraham Lincoln, we are a house divided against itself. To which Luther might well add, this is most certainly true. We exist in a state of uncertainty. There is hope, of course. In John's gospel, worship and doubt only appear together twice. Once in the very last verses of the gospel. 
And again, when Peter steps out of the boat onto the water, and as Peter walks on the water, he begins to doubt. He experiences a state of uncertainty and starts to sink beneath the waves. But in both instances, the state of uncertainty exists apparently without contradiction. The state of uncertainty exists alongside worship of God. That gives me hope for this experiment that you and I are engaged in and the rest of us will be engaged in starting next week. But let's dwell for a moment, as I think we should, on division. Uh, my heart is breaking, and I know that your heart also. In my line of work, I encounter all sorts of people, and it makes me acutely aware of the division that exists between us. I have friends and colleagues who are African American who tell me that when their kid goes out to drive at night, they don't know if their child is coming back because it takes just one encounter with law enforcement to go wrong and they're dead. And they kiss their children goodbye at the door and don't know if they're coming home. And I have many good friends in law enforcement who tell me the horror story of kissing their child goodnight as they go to work their patrol. And they don't know if a call to a domestic dispute or a traffic stop is going to go wrong, and they don't know if that's the last time they'll ever see their child again. And I think one of the things that causes the conflict between us is that we do not hear the stories of the other. Sometimes we hear it, you know, we read it in the newspaper, we hear it on TV, but it doesn't make any deep impression upon us because many of us have already drawn our line in the sand and turn a deaf ear to those stories. And, and we find ourselves using the phrase, well, they would say that, wouldn't they? Whoever they are. That's a very sinful, broken thing that human beings do all the time. We create of other people a concept of them only as other. I don't want to hear your experience as an African American. I, I don't want to hear your experience as a law enforcement officer. I don't want to hear your experience as a peace protester. I don't want to hear your experience as a veteran. We turn the other person into an other. And as soon as they cease to be an another person and become just a nebulous other, then it makes it so much easier to hate them and demonize them. And once we have begun to hate, and demonize, then that other, because of the color of their skin, or the badge they wear, or the uniform they wear, or the placards they carry, that other person can now become disposable. I don't need to care about them, love them, serve them. They can quite literally be dead to me. I think that's a thumbnail sketch of how human beings become disposable to other human beings. And the irony is that by the end of the process, we don't lose a minute's sleep. There was a time in human history, we're told in a lovely myth in the Old Testament 
where human beings were so united in what they were doing that they almost strove to be God. Let's build a tower, these human beings said, and we will reach the heavens. And in this fable, God looks at what human beings are doing and says, they're no longer acting like the creatures of a God who loves them. And at that Tower of Babel, language was invented to divide human beings. I think we've been dividing ourselves one from another from the moment we first crawled out over the slime. Imagine you're foraging for food. At night, you sit around the campfire. The only people you can trust are the ones sitting around that campfire with you. And the rest of human history plays out the same way. Of course, with the help of rulers and kings and princes who manipulate that for their own devices. And those of you who have seen war break out, especially war in Europe, know how easy it is to demonize that other. Even as you read the Gospel of Matthew, you hear Gentiles being spoken of suspiciously in numerous places. And then by the end of Matthew's Gospel, we have the Great Commission. The universal Savior requires a universal mission. Go ye therefore unto all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them all that I have commanded, and I will be with you always, all people. And on this Sunday, as we encounter these readings, we see that universal nature of Christ. On the mountaintop again, where so much has been taught and revealed by God. Jesus does it again. Go to all the nations. The Gentiles are now included. What was now fear is now inclusion. What was once keeping at a distance is now pulling close to the breast. The tragedy of Golgotha is now the glory of Galilee. But the readings today teach us so much more. What are human beings, O oh Lord, that you are so mindful of them, that you have made them little lower than the angels? And in the Genesis account of creation, we see that the creation of human beings is the apex of creation. God created and saw it was good, and God created humankind and saw that they were very good. And yet we divide ourselves because of accent and language, because of the color of skin, because of political creed, or just as in what, maybe 99% of the time, just out of pure fear, fear of the other. And that could be the end of it if the gospel didn't lay claim to our hearts so powerfully, if sacred Scripture didn't teach us so clearly that those divisions, especially divisions like racism, are part of our sinfulness, not part of our everyday life, that to defend them is blasphemy, not just error, blasphemy because God created us in God's image, in God's image and likeness. How dare we then separate ourselves and treat each other as if we were disposable? And so, we are to love each other. We know that because Jesus tells us that so often. Out of all the new commandments Jesus could have given us, 
in the last hours of His freedom, He gave us the commandment that we should love one another. And not just any old way, but to love one another as He loved us, which means we are to love each other as servants of each other. Love each other so much we would wash each other's feet. Love each other so much that we would lay down our lives for our friends. Love each other so much that we would be vulnerable enough to risk the ridicule of everyone we respect in order to show love. And I say that because Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. And that was the way He loved us. And that's the way we love each other. You may have a circle of friends who will think that you are ridiculous if you start to talk about justice and reconciliation, about equality, about the hopes and fears of people that you previously did not understand. Your friends and family may disavow you. Your parishioners may walk out in the middle of a sermon. I've had that happen once or twice. And it wasn't just to use the restroom. When you preach love and dare not to add an asterisk to it, at the very least, you're going to look and sound ridiculous in the eyes of all the people you respect the most. It's not going to be easy. That position of vulnerability where you listen to the story of others, have empathy for others, dare to break ranks with those whose opinions you otherwise value, dare to put friendships on the line, for the sake of truth and justice, for the sake of reconciliation and peace. But it's no more foolish than the words of the Magnificat when the Blessed Mother said, God will cast down the mighty from their thrones and lift up the humble and meek. The rich God will send empty away and the poor shall be exalted and be fed. Nothing we can say can be half as radical as the Blessed Mother. We can't sound any more revolutionary than the Mother of God, nor any more foolish than the words of her Son in the great sermon when He gave us a list of those who are blessed those who mourn, those who are hungry, those who are persecuted, and the peacemakers. No more foolish than for you and I to look at a cross and to believe with all our hearts and souls and mind and strength that on that cross hung the salvation of the whole world. Nothing sounds foolish after that. So the gospel lays a claim to us. Peace, Paul talks about. Kiss one another. Hold true. Listen to what I have said. Love one another. Serve one another. And we see that on this Trinity Sunday in the Trinity itself. I leave you with just a couple of quotes. One is from St. Oscar Romero, and I put this on my Facebook page, should you want to see it. He preached this sermon on Trinity Sunday in 1978. He said, God is not a solitary being. God is three. God is family. God is communion. God is love. Oscar Romero believed that. That's why they murdered him at his altar. Communion and family and relationship is everything. My last story is of J.M. Barry, who wrote Peter Pan. 
He was rector of my university back in Scotland. It was at a time when we had a lot of famous rectors. The person who came after him was Rudyard Kipling. J.M. Barry, writer of Peter Pan, wrote a, a little book. It was his rectorial address called Courage. And in that little book, and the speech delivered in 1922, he looked out over a sea of young faces, all the young men, men at that time, graduating from St. Andrew's University in Scotland. And he said, you know, my generation has failed you. Remember, the First World War, peace only truly came in 1918, 1919. He delivered these words in 1922. My generation has failed you. My generation slaughtered you. My generation let you down when you had the right to look to us to lead and to lead justly. And we led you through Flanders Field. Now it's your turn to lead. Now it's your turn to pick up the pieces and create a world that is more just and more peaceful than the ones that we, the one that we left to you. Incredible words to speak. The former rector was sitting over there, and that was Field Marshal Douglas Haig, who was the supreme British commander throughout World War I. Incredible words to speak. But in conclusion to his speech and to my sermon, J.M. Barry spoke about what mattered. What matters is what we would wish to have again. I mean, isn't that a great measure of what matters? And J.M. Barry looked out at all these young faces at the university graduating, and he said, you know, if you, 50 years from now, you may wish to come back to this incredible Scottish town. After your life has largely passed, and I'm willing to bet that none of you, if you had the chance to do so, would set foot anywhere near the lecture hall. If you could come back 50 years from now and have that time over again, you would not sit in the lecture hall. Instead, your feet would run up the tenement stairs to your student digs, and there again to sit round a fire with your chums. God is not solitary. God is family. God is relationship. God is communion. Let us not blaspheme by pretending otherwise. Amen.
Together we confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, God the Father, the Almighty, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, through one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Called into unity with one another in the whole creation, let us pray for our shared world. God of community, you form us as your church. Guide our bishops, pastors, deacons, and all the baptized in sharing your life-giving good news with all the world. Strengthen us to be bold in our proclamation. Hear us, O God. God of creation, you called everything into being. Sustain this world with your renewing care. Inspire us to see waterways, plant life, birds, fish, insects, insects and mammals, and call them good. Hear us, O God. God of counsel, all authority belongs to you. Encourage the leaders of this and every land to seek peace, equality, and unity. Instill wisdom in advocates who work toward justice in often ignored communities. Hear us, O God. God of care, you created us in your image. Help us to see your likeness in one another. Open our eyes to see and attend to all who face oppression and suffering. Console, heal, and nourish all in need, especially David Barth, Jack Bill, Thomas Bond, Lorraine Bowes, Denise Collins, Georgia Cotter, Pastor Elwood Culp, Charlene Favor, Nancy Hargrave, Cal and Joanne Hawks, Wayne Kafler Sink Sr., Peggy Lawrence, Annie Linscott, Wilma Lynch, Benjamin Most, Sam Myers, Ann Mongillo, David Moore, Carrie Morrison, Emily Nowakowski, Juan Restrepo, Barbara Russell, Mary Ellen Shoup, Iga Stewart, Casey Taylor, Barbara Teller, Alexandra Zalek, Veronica Zalek, and those we name personally at this time. We also pray for Constance Leary and her family upon her passing. Hear us, O God. God of companionship, you accompany this body of faith. As the rhythms of summer begin, protect all who travel, renew all who will enjoy a time of Sabbath, and shelter all who will not be protected from the sun's heat. Hear us, O God. We call upon your spirit of restoration. For all who have contracted coronavirus, we pray for caring and healing. For those who are particularly vulnerable, we pray for safety and protection. For all who experience fear or anxiety, we pray for peace of mind and spirit. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God
God of compassion, you comfort us in our grief with the promise of the resurrection. We give you thanks for the saints of all times and in our lives. Hear us, O God. Receive these prayers, O God, and those too deep for words, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please stand. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but to deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Neither death, nor life, 
nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate you from God in Christ Jesus, God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter. Bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Thank you.